So with that introduction, I can only fuck it up. Um, all right, so let me take you to the future. And um, if you know anything about the future, uh, there is this interesting thing which we call the real soon now. And it is by far the biggest challenge you will face. And let me take you a bit on a uh, time journey. So five years ago, 2013, I was at Google. Google released Google Glass. Uh, I was a Google Glass explorer, so I used Google Glass for about six months. And we kind of all know the Google Glass story, right? It's like, this is my dad, by the way. So I took that picture of my dad. I never told my dad that I'm using this in the presentation. Uh, so it's, and, and Google Glass is this classic problem, right? It's like, it's not great. And people make fun of it. And then uh, we had these guys here. They're some of the world's biggest venture capitalists being photographed with Google Glass. And then uh, people started calling these guys the glass holes. Right? So we make fun of technology because obviously and objectively, it is not good. Now, fast forward only five years, 2018. The Chinese police issue 17,000 of these devices, which look a lot like Google Glass. What they do is they do image recognition, facial recognition on you, recognize you within 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, and compare you to a database of 100,000 uh, criminals. The first weekend they used this in uh, China, they found 26 people. Now, when you look at the technology, it doesn't actually look all that different, right? Google Glass, the Chinese version, all that has changed is computing got a little bit better, and we got a bit more AI. It's really, really important to understand. Again, 2013, my clicker just stopped working. There we go. 2013, Amazon released um, this demo video of Prime Air. And uh, when you go back in my Twitter feed, you will actually find a tweet from me where I took that video and made fun of it. Because, of course, it's crap. Look at this. Like, tiny little drone transporting little pieces of um, parcel, like the size of this clicker. It makes no sense whatsoever. Fast forward to 2018. You now put people into self-flying drones and fly them from hotel to hotel in Dubai. You can do this today. If there's one thing I want you to take out of this presentation, like, literally, forget everything I tell you. Like, take one thing out of it. That is that tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. It's really important to understand. And when I say tomorrow, I'm not saying 20, you know, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, 5 years from now. Literally tomorrow. We'll explore this a little bit further in a minute. Here's a little, like, like my first um, tip for you. Um, this is William Gibson, who's a science fiction author, and he wrote that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. What this means is you don't need to invent the future. All you need to do is open your eyes and open your pockets. The future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. If we want to know how, if 10 years ago you wanted to know how virtual reality looks like, you could see virtual reality, like the way we see it today. It just cost you a million dollars. So let me walk you through a little bit, first of all, like the framework of this exponential thinking, so that we are all getting on the same page. So an exponential trend, classic exponential trend is this here. It's a doubling every time period. It goes from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Um, we call this the hockey stick curve. Any entrepreneurs in the audience? OK, so this is your revenue slide. So you can take a picture now, put some numbers behind it. Uh, quite frankly, I was a venture capitalist. This is every business which pitched me was the revenue slide. And then, of course, the best known exponential trend is Moore's law. Gordon Moore, 50 years ago, said, number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every two years. This has been true for 50 years and effectively means your computer at the same price point gets twice as fast every two years. Just to put this into perspective and make it feelable for you, uh, this is a computer called Pi Zero. It's the size of a, a little bit smaller than the size of a, a pack of gum. Costs five bucks. It's a full-scale computer. You can put a monitor on there, you can uh, put a keyboard and a mouse in there, some memory, and you can run, run Windows on this baby. For the price of a venti Starbucks latte, you can now buy two and a half times the compute power of a Cray-1. A Cray-1 was released in the mid-70s, was the first real supercomputer we had, and each of those Cray-1s had more compute power than NASA had total to put the man on the moon. So literally, for a cup of coffee, you get two and a half times the compute power NASA had to put Neil Armstrong on the moon, or did they put him on the moon? It's a different story. Ray Kurzweil, our co-founder, um, world expert in these exponentially accelerating trends, um, formulated something called the Law of Accelerating Returns. It's a little bit of a complex um, paper, so let me make this super easy for you. There's one graph in this, in this paper which is really important to understand, and it's this one. 
So what Ray did is he said, he had an interesting question. He said, we know Moore's law is, is true for 50 years, but we also know that these trends come to an end, right? Number of transistors on a square inch doubles every two years. If you take this to its logical extreme, you get to a world where you have subatomic scale transistors. It doesn't work. So these things are actually S-curves. So what he did is he looked at a slightly different number. He said, how many calculations can I perform per one second per $1,000? And then he looked at these different technology stages. So before we had integrated circuit, we had transistors. And before that, we had tubes, and so on and so on. And he found that this trend is true for the last 110 years. So the last 110 years, we as humans have doubled our capacity in compute power at a, at a set price point very, very consistently. And the sole reason why this graph is interesting is a very simple hypothesis. You can take this graph, and you can extrapolate it into the future. This graph will tell you how good computing will be in the future. And you can use it to determine the point in time when the phone in your pocket, a $1,000 computer, will be computationally as smart as a human brain, which happens in 11 years. 2029, literally your iPhone will be computationally as smart as you are. And then it gets interesting, right? Because two years later, two human brains, then four human brains, and eight, and 16. And by 2050, 2060, the phone in your pocket has the compute power of every single human on this planet, 7.4 billion brains in one $1,000 device. That is to say, tomorrow looks dramatically different than today. Tomorrow, the phone in your pocket will be smarter than you are. Now, my wife says this is true for me today. <laughs> A bit of a different discussion. Now, here's where this is interesting. So the computing stuff you might get. We see these exponential trends in many other industries as well. I just brought two industries for you. One has nothing to do with computing. The other one is driven by computing. Um, let's start with, oh, I actually brought you three. Let's start with this. Energy. Energy today is carbon-based. Energy of the future is solar-based um, for a very simple reason, price performance. Kilowatt hour price in the 70s for solar based power was about $80. To give you in perspective, the price you pay if you're a utility to produce energy, the cheapest form of energy is about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's way too expensive. 10 years later, price dropped by one order of magnitude to $10. Today, price of energy in California, solar, no subsidies, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. We have reached what is called parity. A year later, Dubai announced that they're going to produce a 800 megawatt um, solar powered facility at a price point of only three cents a kilowatt hour. The leader of the German company Energy, which is the largest energy producer in, in Germany, says that energy by 2040, they will not sell you energy anymore. It's a really interesting world. Like Energy will become free. There's something called Swanson's Law. For every doubling in, in solar panels um, installed, the price drops by another 20 to 50%. It's a really interesting world. It means that when we get to parity, there is no other trend than going down to zero. Here's where this becomes really interesting. This is work from a German PhD. The thing you see, the, the, the square you see on your left-hand side, that is the size of a theoretical solar power panel, which is required to power the world's energy consumption, the need of the world's energy consumption as it stands today. Which is interesting because we believe we live in a world of scarcity, whereas in reality we actually live in a world of abundance. Also leads to interesting things. It's like if any of you has uh, stock holdings, equity holdings in an energy company, I would probably sell those because we will see a drop in energy stock prices which is bigger than the 2009 uh, crisis. That's a lot of people say this. Uh, Norway, your neighbor, uh, just divested their, um, uh, their public fund, divested out of every single energy stock out of that reason. Let me show you something else, DNA. So DNA, uh, genetics, has two sides. The one is reading DNA, the other one is writing DNA. I want to focus on reading for a simple reason again, price performance. The first time we sequenced a full human genome as part of the Human Genome Project was completed in 1999, took seven years, cost us $2.7 billion, multinational effort, the first time, massive breakthrough for mankind. That price today, $100. 
steepest drop in price we've ever seen in any technology bar none within two decades. You go from a nation state can do it exactly once because it's so expensive to your doctor can prescribe this. When you look at these price performance curves, you want to ask yourself two important questions. This is your second lesson. Look at price performance curves and ask yourself two questions. The first is, where does this go? And experts, my colleagues, will tell you sequencing a genome in the next 10 years will become effectively free. Pennies. A colleague of mine jokes and says, and probably he doesn't actually joke, says, Every time you flush the toilet, we will sequence your genome and give you a full health report because the water which is required to flush the toilet is more expensive than the sequencing of the genome. It's really interesting. And then you can do really interesting, crazy stuff with it. This is a company we invested into. What they're doing is they're sequencing your bloodstream. So you take a simple blood test, and they look in your bloodstream for RNA, which is a building block of DNA. It's a simplification. And what they found is that Different types, certain different types of cancer shed RNA into your bloodstream. They can detect those cancers in a test which costs less than $200 and takes 20 minutes pre-stage one, earlier than any other test on the planet, and then, of course, can treat you. Anyone here is under 25 or has kids under 25? Okay, good for you. For a simple reason, none of you will most likely die of cancer anymore. Cancer will be eradicated in the next 20, to tw uh, 20 years. There's uh, no question. Not every type of cancer, but the vast amount of cancers. It's a pretty great outlook. But let me show you something weird. This is a friend of mine, Heather Dewey Hockbord, an artist based out of New York City. And she has an interesting take on what this new world will look like. Uh, and I let Heather talk about it herself. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. New York artist Heather Dewey Hagford. Heather Dewey Hagford. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? just to unpack what you just saw. Heather literally picks up cigarette butts on the streets of New York, on a cigarette butt is your saliva, in your saliva is your DNA. She extracts the DNA using a technique the FBI has mastered about 30 years ago. If you're watching CSI on television, same thing. Then she sends that data off to an advanced genetics testing lab where they sequence it for $100 and then reconstruct your facial features out of your DNA. Because of course your facial features are encoded in your DNA color of your hair, eye color, skull shape, etc. She then takes that data, puts it into a 3D model, prints these 3D masks. Again, that is to say, tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. If you're drinking out of one of these cups at the moment, and you throw that paper cup away, we can pick up that cup, sequence the DNA on it, and I can tell you with one digit after the comma what your theoretical chance of getting Alzheimer's is. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is, A, to freak you out, of course, but B, and this is much more important, th this is something we all have to think about. There is currently not a single jurisdiction in the world, no single country in the world where this is illegal. I speak to a lot of politicians about this. There's not even a debate we're having about the ethics and the morals of this. This is crazy. But it's happening. It's not theoretical. It's happening already. Let me show you another really weird one. So this is AI, artificial intelligence, right? We can use AI to use um, IBM Watson looking at CT and MRI scans and detecting cancers mu much better than a human being. So cancer, um, a lung cancer detection on a, by, with a human being in a complicated case is about a 50-50 chance that they see the cancer. IBM Watson has a 75% chance. The Mayo Clinic, which is the leading clinic in the US, deems it unethical to not use IBM Watson for good reason, right? And then we can play Go, right? Google played AlphaGo, destroyed the human in the most complex board games humans have ever invented. Just to give you an idea, the number of moves in the game of Go exceeds the atoms in the universe. You can't brute force your way through this game. It's impossible. And yet, they played against the world champion, won four out of five games. And then we can feed 
weird art into an AI and have it come up with new art, the domain we claimed for us. And then it creates this here. And of course, I actually believe they fed some uh, LSD into that, um, <laughs> uh, that AI. But so let me show you how weird this looks in the world. There's a group of Chinese PhDs, and they write their PhD thesis on a really weird idea. They say, we take 750 pictures, photos, mugshots, of Chinese inmates, convicted criminals, and we scan them in an AI. And we use 750 picture, pictures as a control group of just average Chinese people. And then we run them both through a facial recognition algorithm, which is very similar to the thing you go through a, um, a passport control at a border. And then we ask the AI a simple but kind of weird question. We give you a new picture, some, a picture you have never seen before, and then we ask you, is that person a criminal or is it not? This is weird, right? It's a stupid question. With an 89% accuracy, this AI can tell you if that person is a criminal. If you watch Minority Report, this is called the precox. It's a weird world we're moving in. So here's a challenge. Albert L. Bartnett once said this, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. And what this means is that we as humans are really not well prepared for this exponential world. Let me show you how this looks like. Imagine you take 30 linear steps, one step after the other, right? One, two, three, four, five. You know exactly how far you get. It's like 30 meters. If I were to ask you how far is it, you could point to the point in space, and you would be pretty accurate. Now, technology moves on this exponential curve, so let's move on an exponential curve. Every step is twice as far as your last step. You go from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on, and you double. How far do you get? 30 times. It's really hard, right? Even if you can do the math, by the way. Sometimes I find people who can do the math, it's a billion meters. If I ask you how far is it, like how far does it feel, pretty much nobody knows. It's 25 times around planet Earth. It's a really weird thing, because the thing here is technology moves on an exponential curve, but we don't feel it. So you have to force yourself to do the math to understand where technology will be in the future. In this curve are three interesting points. Point number one is this here. Our linear thinking wants technology to be better than it really is in the beginning. This is what we call disappointment. Google Glass, right? Too expensive, battery life was terrible, features are mediocre, you look like an idiot. You're disappointed. But then Steve Jobs gets on stage and shows you 11 years ago the iPhone, and everybody understands a phone isn't a phone anymore, a phone is a computer, it doesn't have buttons, it has glass. It. And then you get to chaos and amazement, a world where you can't keep up with the changes we're seeing in the world. If you stay on that line, if you stay in your thinking on this line, it's your path to doom. You need to get off there. I want to stay in this disappointment phase a little bit more. I'm not talking about crying hipsters. I want to talk about this here. Any one of you is using uh, Siri, Alexa, Google Now, Cortana, Bixby, a few of you, right? So in a lot of ways, think about this. It's magic. I grew up on Star Trek. This is Star Trek. I can talk to my damn computer. It's unbelievable. But it isn't really good yet, because most of the time, at least in my interactions, it still sounds an awful lot like this. What time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I said, what time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I'm not asking about Tuesday. I don't know what you mean by, I'm not asking about Tuesday. How about a web search for it? So classic Siri fail, right? I have about, I don't know, eight of those Google Home devices at home, like literally in every room, and I love, love, love tripping them up. But here's the interesting thing about Siri. Siri is only seven years old. It's a kit. Of course it's not good yet. Of course. Here's the interesting thing about Siri, and you know, I'm using Siri as a proxy. Google Now and Cortana, they're all the same thing in this regard. They double in capacity every single year. They get twice as good every single year. More slow about every year. The question for me becomes, how good is Siri when it's 14 years old? How good is Siri in seven years from now? And now here's the interesting thing, right? If I were to ask you without priming you in exponential thinking, I guarantee you the number one answer I get is 14, seven times two. 
Well, you know it's 128. And now the interesting question comes, what does it mean if Siri is 128 times as good as today? Well, now you need to do the hard work. Now you need to do what we call first principles. You now you need to say, what is Siri? Siri is voice recognition, understanding what you say, cognition, understanding what you mean, and a bunch of services that it connects to. You multiply those out by 100, and in seven to 10 years, Siri and all these other systems will be better than any human in understanding you. In seven to 10 years, it will be absolutely 100% normal for you to talk to your computer. And then it gets interesting, because if you run a call center, your call center's gone. You don't need call centers anymore. I was with a German car company, and they shall go unnamed to not blame them. And they showed me the car dashboard for their new luxury car, and they were really proud of it, and rightfully so. It's beautiful, like wood and Kevlar and big screen and joysticks and buttons. And I'm asking the question, I was like, when does this go into production? I said, it's coming 2018, it's now in production. I was like, that's great, how long will it stay in production? I said, seven years. And I was like, you don't need car dashboards anymore. I don't want to push buttons in a car. I want to get into the car and say to the car, car, play the radio. And the car will be like, hey, Pascal, I, love the, I know that you love the 80s, so let me play some tunes for you. Right? And the sheer act of forgetting will be gone. Today, I can come to my wife and say, hey, honey, I forgot the milk. Tomorrow, Siri will yell at me and say, like, Pascal, I told you three times on the way back to pick up the milk. Here's an important insight. Once a technology becomes digitized, it moves on an exponential curve. It's a really interesting insight. By the way, my friends in the uh, AV booth, you are actually showing my old slides. If you wouldn't mind swapping them over for the new ones while I entertain the public. Mm -hmm. um, so it's perfect. You guys are the best. Already happened. Um, the biggest, really, the biggest business opportunities you can find is you find something which is analog and you can turn it into digital. A reason why Silicon Valley pours billions of dollars into medical technology, healthcare, analog businesses turning into digital, and a weird business called ag tech, agricultural technology farming. It's crazy. All right, so let me show you this. Anyone has read Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma? Quick show of hands, a few people, come on. Yeah, perfect. So this guy here, Clayton Christensen, wrote 25 years ago, wrote a book which defined the term disruptive. Before that, we had no model to describe, it of course happened, disruptive innovation always happened, but we had no model for it. And so he wrote a, a book called this, um, Innovator's Dilemma, and then later a book called The Innovator's Solution, and he described something uh, which he calls disruptive innovation. And I want to explain the model to you because that model is outdated. We're seeing disruption in different ways now, and I'll show you how this looks like. First of all, understand there's a difference between innovation and disruption. Innovation is doing the same things, but better. Classic example, uh, if you take a washing powder, your washing powder next generation is more white, and then it's super white, and then it's ultra white, and then it's super, super white. It's kind of the same thing, it's just getting better. Then there's a thing in the middle, which is this like doing new things. So now instead of giving you washing powder, I give you a washing liquid or a little ball you put into your washing. But then disruption happens. Disruption is, doing new things which make the old things obsolete. Disruption is, I create a shirt which you don't need to wash anymore. That's disruption. So Clayton's model is very simple. Clayton says, there's a, a line, a performance line for what we call the customer need. This is what the customer expects a product to do in any dimension. And then you've got the incumbent, the existing company, the old company. At one point in the existing company's history, they hit that point. They said, like, we produce a product which the customer likes. And then what they're doing is what is called sustaining innovation. So they're making the product a little bit better, and the customer requires it, right? We as customers go to our companies and say, yeah, I want to see the same thing, but I want to have it better. So they, we're pulling them alongside this path. And the insight Clayton had was there's a new entry, a new thing, the shirt, which I don't need to wash anymore. And in the beginning, it's crappy. We saw this, right? Google Glass, crappy. You can only sell it to a few people, and those few people buy it for very specific reasons. And the big insight was, and the big mistake people made was, people always believed before that, that you have to make a product which is as good as the market standard. And that's not true. You need to make a product which is as good as what the customer needs, not as good as the market standard. So here's a simple example, and I use the phone because, you know, it's obvious. By the second phone from the left, phone manufacturers had hit the good enough line. 
right? I get like a week's worth of telephone time and you know, small enough, all this good stuff. And then I go on like sustaining innovation. So it gets a little bit better, a little bit better. And by the pinnacle of it, I have the Nokia N95. I owned this thing. Mm -hmm. Two weeks of battery life. I mean, take that iPhone. Two weeks. <laughs> Two cameras. They were crappy, but they were cameras. And a little bit of the internet on it. But then something, at the same time, something happened. There were these smartphones coming up. And in the beginning, they were crappy. Their battery life was about three, day, three hours. You needed like a day at least, right? And their features weren't great. But there were a few people buying them because they wanted to have the internet on their phone or they wanted to have their calendar on their phone or something. And then Steve Jobs like, throws this iPhone over the fence. And the iPhone is the first phone which has like a day's worth of battery life and all these cool features. And it makes the old thing obsolete. And then this thing moves on, the next, on a curve where it then becomes sustaining. So we have this model. This is how we explain disruptive innovation to this day. Now here's an interesting question. Electric car. Is the electric car disruptive or not? Is it sustaining innovation? Is it just the old thing, just we swap the engine? Or is it different? Lots of people, and check in with yourself, a lot of people say, oh, this is just you know, sustaining innovation. It's the same thing. It's a car. So here's the question then. If you take a combustion engine, normal car, and you apply this model, and you ask yourself this, the interesting question, what is the good enough line? Like, what are the features people care about? Speed and range are two of them. Speed, where I come from, California, speed limit is 65 miles an hour. If you drive above 80 miles an hour, you see yourself in front of a judge instead of just getting a ticket. So nobody drives above 80 miles an hour because you're, it's not, you're not stupid, right? By the way, everybody drives 80 miles an hour, right? <laughs> so speed, if, you're, if your car drives like, let's say, 90 miles an hour, is well good enough. Range, we know that 99.8% of drives are less than 100 miles, so about 200 kilometers. So the electric car looked like this in the beginning, right? It had neither. It wasn't fast, it didn't have range. And a few people bought it because they wanted to have it for you know, city dwelling or because they're like eco-warriors. Whatever the reason is, they buy it. And then Tesla comes out. And Tesla brings this weird thing out in the market which is called the Tesla Model S. And here's what the Tesla Model S does. It breaks through every one of these barriers. So it gives me 250 miles range, way enough. It has better crash test rating than any car on the market because the battery is on the bottom and so on. It has two trunks because the engine is in the, in the trunk, in the bottom of the trunk. It has software updates. It's basically a phone on wheels. It has less than 80 moving parts. It doesn't break down anymore and accelerates really, really nicely. Here's how this plays out in the world. Here's the disruption, the face of disruption. If you bought a Tesla a couple years ago, this is a true story. One night, um, Elon Musk wakes up, and he knows that they over-engineered the engine, right? So they, they don't use all the power of the engine. They built this in that particular way. And he comes up and goes to his engineers and says, you know, what do we do with this over-engineered engine? Can we do something interesting with it? And the engineers say, like, well, we could, you know, we could make the car accelerate faster if you want to. It's a software update. So one morning, you wake up, and in your car now is a button on your screen because you don't have physical buttons anymore, right? You have a screen. And on that screen is a, is a button which says insane mode. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, put that, you press that button, the car accelerates in 2.27 seconds. 2.27 seconds is faster than all but four cars in the world which are, which are not you know, one-off cars. It compares to a McLaren uh, F1, $1.5 million. Uh, La Ferrari, La Ferrari, $1 million. Uh, Viron Bugatti, God knows how much money that car is. Uh, and the Koenigsegg, uh, which is a very small car. You put people in this. Let me just show you what the face of disruption looks like today. So you, and there's a little bit of swearing in it, so pardon about that. So you put people in it, and you show them insane mode. And it looks like this. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like, it's not like just... Boy, that's that, perfect. That's, Isn't that good? That's a random... Like, that's the future. The car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have, you know, like an insane mode, right? That makes sense. So you just come to like a complete stop. All right. And then before you know it, you just jam. Oh it. shit, Brooks! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Seventy miles an hour. Brooks, oh <laughs> shit! Yo, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. <laughs> like you gotta give people fair warning. Why? Like you can't fucking just say. Yeah, you can. Brooks, what? I think I shit it in your seat. <laughs> <laughs>
So you're going to go insane? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead and press the insane button. I'm not going to throw up. I hope not. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, you okay? That's not funny. You, you, you okay? <laughs> Does it feel like a roller coaster? Oh man, it did. Yeah, isn't that weird? But there's no no build up. No. It just it just goes. Holy shit! When do you do that? All the time. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I do. No, you don't drive do. like that. No, not all the time. Oh my god! <laughs> I thought it was gonna. What's the word? Gradual. Take off. Are you okay? I think so. Okay. So basically, right there, that's the sport and insane mode. Right? How do you got an insane on the fucking car? Isn't that great? Who puts an insane mode on the car? So basically, um, you know, you press that button. So you ain't got to worry about it. You stage and stage and simple because no, you just stage and you go. God <laughs> damn it, that motherfucker accelerates. 65 miles an hour. <laughs> right there. This is faster than McLaren on the start, oh, ain't it, guy? Oh, yeah. yeah. God damn it. <laughs> I mean, it takes you by surprise, right? Boy, that. Okay, so you get the idea. That is the phase of disruption today. And here's the interesting thing about the model. Our old model, you remember, the old model was this kind of like, we need to get to customer needs, and we're still not quite as good as the market. The new model is this. This is what you need to be careful with. Like, the new model is like all these kids out there building their startups, or all the innovative older companies, they build stuff which makes the old stuff obsolete but then does something which is much better than what you have already. And you have no time to react to this. I was recently in um, a beautiful little German town where they make sports cars. And I can tell you, these people freaking out. Because this is a four-door sedan. It's a family car. It drives faster than any car this company makes. A week, two weeks after uh, uh, Elon Musk rolls out insane mode, the engineers come back to Elon and say, hey, you know what? We tweaked the algorithm a little bit. Can we send out a software update? And Elon says, like, sure, why not? The next morning you wake up, you go into your garage, you see your car. What was insane is now called ludicrous mode. <laughs> if you have the top of the line Tesla, which is the P100D, and you use ludicrous mode, it accelerates faster than any car, any single car on this planet which you can buy, which is not a sing like a you know, one-off car, like a race car. And you can put your kids in there. It's a weird world. <laughs> and two trunks, by the way, right? So, so here's, here's, let me conclude with this. We're living in really exciting times, like scary but really exciting times, because it's for the first time in human history Individuals, you, have the same innovation power as big companies and even nation states. And it will change everything. There's three billion people online today. We expect the next two billion people to come online in the next five to ten years. And they will come online on 5G internet. Imagine what we unleash on this world in terms of innovation. Imagine how different this world will look like. And imagine, by the way, what kind of problems the people who will come online now will solve. Because I can guarantee you they will not solve how do I get food from a restaurant which is across the street on my table without leaving the house. They will solve real problems with these powers. Really fascinating. We're at this really, really interesting intersection where these lines are crossing. And I get this question all the time. So I, like, what do you think is the future? What do you think? I, I don't know. And I believe that nobody knows, really. And if someone comes to you and says, like, I'm a futurist, I can tell you what the future is, they, they lie, because the future is unwritten. That's the beauty of the future. It is on us to create this future. It is on us to determine where we want to go. And the, the obligation we have is to write this future, because if we don't, we become a passive player in this world. And it's a really nasty place to be. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw once said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man and woman. We have to be unreasonable in this world. Every single one of you needs to be unreasonable. This, has been a this quote has been attributed to many, many people. Bill Gates wrote this in one of his books. 
The short version of it is we, un we overestimate the short and underestimate the long-term implications of technology. We do this all the time, and I'm guilty of it as everybody else. Two years ago, when I first saw virtual reality in a consumer headset, I looked at this and I was like, oh my god, I was so excited about it. It's going to change. Today, when you go out there, I don't know if you played with virtual reality, it's good, but it's not world changing. So what we do is we overestimate it, we, and then we get disappointed. And we look at it, it's like we're like, nah, it's not that great, and the headsets are big, and they're tethered, and they're good. right? But remember, 2013, 2018. In 10 years, virtual reality will be so good that we will have people who choose to live their lives in virtual reality because it's better than their lives, right? So don't underestimate the long-term implications of technology. Ernest Hemingway wrote in one of his books a quote, well, it's like a, a part, and it's now called the Hemingway Law of Motion, which is gradually and then suddenly. The real quote is, Sam asks Will, how did you go bankrupt? Will answers two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And I think this is really important to understand because I believe this is the, not that you want to go bankrupt, like see it as an opportunity, but understand that technology has this thing which is gradually, 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 and then suddenly everything changes. With that, thank you so much. I hope some of the stuff I said to you, uh, for you, presented for you today was helpful. Um, by all means, please stay in touch. Um, I'm a very sociable person. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Let me just say it was a perfect uh, ending of this day. Uh, we're looking at the future here. If, if, if people are sitting out there thinking, OK, uh, if my company or myself is, is going to be ready for this, mm -hmm. How are you going to, you know, keep uh, things going if, if, if the exponential growth are going like this? Yes. So I think you want to see it. First of all, I, I, I really believe you want to see this as an opportunity. And what you need to do is you need to become much more spatially aware of what is happening around you. Because the typical the disruption doesn't happen in the field you're actually looking at. Right? You know what's happening in this field. Like the car manufacturer I spoke to, they know what's happening in automotive and autonomous cars and electric vehicles, what they didn't see was Siri, because it's left field. So I believe like the a role we today need to do is we need to be become like scanner. We need to scan the landscape and figure out like how does this whole stuff, that's the role we have as managers. How does it fit together? We had uh, Peter Sunde up here on stage uh, earlier today and uh, let, let's just say People were a little, you know, downmooded afterwards. They think, okay, uh, our job's gone. We don't know anything. Is this uh, something we should see as a threat? This uh, this new future, mm. or is it giving us more possibilities? Um, Hopefully, so something good. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I, I, I believe that um, there is. You know, I, I pointed this out, right? There's ethical, moral questions we need to figure out, like future of jobs, all these kind of stuff we need to figure out. But we really have the tools in our hands to create what we want to create. It's I, I mean, honestly, it's unbelievable, the powers we have in our hands, and it will only get better. Um, so I believe if we engage in this, if we as humans decide to do the right thing, we're in a really good shape. Great. Uplifted. <laughs> Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.